action that seemed to last forever. And what have you got after all that? The Minnesota North Stars against the Pittsburgh Penguins in the Stanley Cup Final 1991 edition. Game one is set for Wednesday night at the Civic Arena in Pittsburgh. And this is truly a series of firsts. First time the Penguins have been to the final. Also the first time two 1967 expansion teams have met in the finals. John Casey and Tom Barrasso, the goaltenders, the first two American goaltenders to face each other in the cup final. And it's the first time since 1934 the two teams who have never won a cup have met in the Stanley Cup final. Okay, Sam, let's look. Today on Sports Desk, can Mario work his magic? Game one of the finals in Pittsburgh. Denny Boucher still looking for that elusive first major league win. And the Pistons and Celtics collide in a crucial game five matchup. Desk is brought to you by Suzuki, makers of Swift, Samurai, and Sidekick. If it's Suzuki, it's all right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Sports Desk. I'm Gino Retta. Nice to have you here. Also coming up, another pro hockey league gets a kick at the can in Hamilton. Soccer fans, highlights from the Cup Winners Cup, and Bill Parcell steps down. But first, 21 teams took the ice on October the 4th with aspirations of earning the right to still be playing hockey right now, but only two remain. Pittsburgh and Minnesota. The Penguins in their first visit to the final while the Stars have been there once before but came up empty. This marks the first time since 1934 that two teams which have never won the Stanley Cup meet in the final. Pittsburgh got some bad news just before the game. Doctors told Paul Coffey he could not play because his jaw hadn't fully healed yet. And the Penguins get on the scoreboard early, though, even without him. Just 3.45 into the game. Ron Francis wins the draw. Olf Samuelson shoots it through the traffic. John Casey never saw it. one nothing Penguins. Minnesota comes right back. Neil Broughton tries to center the puck, but it goes off. The defenders skate into his own net. Gordy Roberts scores, and it's 1-1 tie. Still in the first. Stars are buzzing again. Tom Barrasso makes a couple of stops. Olf Dahlin puts in his rebound, and it's 2-1 Stars. Late in the first, Stars are two men short, but on the power play, the Pens are able to score. Almost scored. Mario Lemieux gets the best chance, but he stopped. Early in the second, on a Minnesota power play. Mario Lemieux on the breakaway. This time he scores. Tying the game at two. Special teams put the Stars in front just a short while later as Mark Bureau rips it by Barrasso, a shorthanded goal. Three to two for the Stars. Later in the second, Pittsburgh ties it at three and looks to go ahead. But Casey kicks out the pad and burns Bob Airy. Late in the second, off faceoff, Rotten gets a couple of whacks at it. Slides in his second of the game, and it's 4-3 to three for the Stars. Early in the third, Dallin flips a pass to Bobby Smith. He cuts in on goal and somehow beats Barrasso to the short side, and it's 5-3 Minnesota. Pittsburgh gets one back when John Casey loses the puck and escapes. Joey Mullen tucks it in, and it's 5-4 to four Minnesota. And the North Stars hang on to win game number one of this series by just that final score, five to four. The Stars lead the series one to nothing. Goal scores, recapping them for you. Broughton with a pair. Dolan, Bureau, and Bobby Smith for Minnesota. For Pittsburgh, it was Samuelson, Lemieux, Young, and Mullen. And after the game, Bob Ganey had high praise for the penalty killing unit. Tonight in the first period, uh, we survived the first period uh, because of our penalty killing and because of our goaltending. That's a place that, uh, that's one of the things this year that did improve for us and a noticeable improvement and made a big difference in our uh, production. First game's always tough as we haven't played these guys in a while. You see what they can do and we're going to make some adjustments, they're going to make some adjustments and uh, both teams will just be fired up for the next game. We didn't win so something's got to change, you know, maybe the scoreboard. But, uh, you know, other than that, we're, uh, let's play hard and get the loose pucks. We didn't get to the loose pucks tonight. When we don't get loose pucks, our team doesn't win. We just have to regroup, and that's the way it is in the playoffs. Uh, tomorrow it's a new day, and uh, we're going to have a meeting and see what we can do better and uh, prepare for next game. Last chance for the Sault Ste. Marie. Yes, is in the books. The North Stars with a notch in the win column, and the Penguins have already lost home ice advantage. The teams are off, and will step back onto the ice Friday night for game two at the Igloo. Interesting note, the Stars have now won the first game of every one of their playoff series this season. Conversely, the Penguins have lost every single game won. But as Ken Chilebeck reports, Penguin fans are still hoping their hockey team will live up to 
Pittsburgh City of Champions title. The evidence is everywhere. Pittsburgh is ready for the Stanley Cup final. Wednesday was a first that Penguins in their long history had never gotten this far. It's a team known more for failure than success. They're front page news though, and the hockey fans in the city want to be part of history. Pittsburgh is a city steeped in successful sporting teams, the great Steeler football teams, the Pirates in their World Series successes. The road to respect for the Penguins has been a bumpy one, and the Penguins want their place in the city's history. It's good to see uh, us come to the top this year to prove that we're in the, in, you know, in the category of the city of champions. History of game of hockey in this city goes back a long ways. Actually goes back to 1925. They had a club here called the Pirates then, but success between then and now has been virtually non-existent. But as one former owner puts it, the things that take the longest to get there maybe mean the most. Well, the atmosphere in this city may be proving that correct. Ken Cholbeck, TSN in Pittsburgh. So it's game two, Friday the 17th, the North Stars, the Penguins, at the Igloo in Pittsburgh. Glenn Anderson and his Oiler teammates are vacationing, but the NHL hasn't forgotten what happened in game number four of the Campbell Conference Final. Anderson has been suspended for the first three games of next season for kicking Minnesota's Gaetan Duchesne in the chest. Chikudami and Drummond. on TSN. Today on Sports Desk, Pittsburgh looks to the magic of Mario to get back on even terms. Dave Steve looks to continue his dominance over the White Sox. And the Pistons looking to put the squeeze on the Celtics. Desk is brought to you by Suzuki, makers of Swift, Samurai, and Sidekick. If it's Suzuki, it's all right. Hello, everyone. Glad that you could join us for this edition of Sports Desk. Also ahead on the show, the Ottawa Senators have a new look. We will show you their new team logo. We'll also hear from Lenny Dykstra. He held his first press conference since his accident. But first, a game two of the Stanley Cup final, Minnesota in Steeltown to take on the Penguins. The North Stars had a one to nothing series lead he heading into game two at the Civic Arena in Pittsburgh. Game two was crucial because the Penguins knew that they couldn't afford to be down two to nothing when the series shifted back to Bloomington. The North Stars are almost unbeatable on home ice. They've lost just twice at the Met Center since mid-January. But the big story Friday night was the return of Penguin defenseman Paul Coffey. He'd missed most of the playoffs with a broken jaw, and the fans got their wish as Coffey returned to action and sporting a protective chin guard. Later on in the first, Dolph Samuelson delivers another questionable check, this time on Brian Bellows. Then Minnesota's Mark Tenorti returns the favor with a knee to Mark Recchi. So the rough stuff over with, North Star power play, Bob Airy walks out, makes a nice play, fires the high shot past Casey, and Pittsburgh goes ahead one to nothing. Recchi finding the going tough in this game, Sean Chambers gives him the ride there. Later on in the first, the Penguins on the power play, Mario Lemieux returns a pass to Kevin Stevens, he scores, and the Penguins go up two to nothing. Early in the second, Minnesota makes history. Mike Modano gets two chances. North Stars, 33rd power play goal of the playoffs is a new NHL record. Later on in the second, Vintage Mario. Watch this goal. Unbelievable. Pittsburgh goes up 3-1. to one, And they are happy. Tom Barrasso is much better in game two. Here's Stu Gavin goes in on the breakaway, but he stopped him. Still in the second, Casey makes the initial save. Stevens gets the puck through the crowd, shovels it in. 4-1 Penguins, they go on to win this one. The Penguins were happy out on the ice and they were dancing in the aisles. Is that Elvis? Pittsburgh, 4-1 final, so that ties this series up at one. Taking a look at the goal scorers, Kevin Stevens got his 14th and 15th of the playoffs. Also scoring Bob Area, Mario Lemieux, Mike Medano got his 7th of the playoffs for Minnesota. 
And after the game, Penguins coach Bob Johnson was awfully glad that this series was tied, heading back to Minnesota. We're playing in the finals of the Stanley Cup. If they want to play in New Orleans, Minnesota, we'll play there. If they want to play in Duluth, Minnesota, hey, there's only two teams left, and it's the best out of seven. Now it's the best out of five. Well, the first time I came down on uh, Chambers, uh, I tried on the outside, and uh, he caught up with me, and uh, I tried the same move, and at the last second, I just came back on the inside. Uh, he thought I was going to go on the outside, so I uh, just came back and uh, saw Casey charging at me and just uh, went to the back end. I thought we had some really good chances when the score was 2-1, to one and we didn't cash in on them, and uh, Barrasso played well. And, uh, you know, you can't expect to win every game. You know, any hockey player will tell you, you've been out a month and you missed the Stanley Cup, it's great to get back in. You know, I was just happy to maybe help out a little bit. The guys have played great throughout the last month, and, you know, I'm just happy to get back in there. North Stars owner Norm Green has found himself in an interesting position. He says that he wants to lose money this season. Now, for businessman Green, who has made his millions dabbling in commercial real estate, it did sound like a strange comment. But apparently, if the Stars get three home games in the final series but lose the Stanley Cup to Pittsburgh, then Green will break even. But if they win the Cup, then he'll have to pay a few player bonuses. But Green says that he'll gladly pay extra if it involves bringing the Stanley Cup to Minnesota. The Ottawa Senators are still more than a year away from playing their first NHL game, but they already have a new look. Word is, the NHL was not happy with their original logo, so Friday the Senators unveiled their new look, and it was a little sooner than expected. This was how the hockey world first saw the Ottawa Senators, the word Ottawa in the form of the Parliament Building. But the Senators didn't intend it to be their logo. It was a symbol of their Bring Back the Senators campaign. While this will remain the symbol of the club, the actual team logo, which will appear on the jersey, will be much different. It'll be the profile of an ancient Roman senator. Well, I think the new crest is uh, pretty exciting compared to a lot of the other NHL teams. I think it's closer to the uh, Chicago Blackhawks uh, logo in terms of the look. And I think and in Chicago is one of the nicest uh, crests in the league. So I think it's going to be a real exciting logo. The franchise had planned to unveil the new logo next week in a ceremony in Ottawa, but an Ottawa newspaper jumped the gun by printing a fairly close representation of the crest on Friday. The ceremony will still go ahead next week as planned, at which time the whole uniform will be modeled. The Senator's brass is upset because they invested close to $8,000 into the official unveiling ceremony and had hoped to keep the crest a secret until that time. Today on Sports Desk, a goaltender's duel in the old Quebec Memorial Cup semifinal. It was a rematch of the Quebec Junior League final, Shakutumi against Drummondville. The winner would advance to the Memorial Cup final against the Western Hockey League's Spokane Chiefs. It's been five years since the Quebec team has advanced to the championship game. That streak will end this year. The only question left was which Quebec team would advance. And the goalies Here's steal Perron. this show it's early. Charbonneau. Sebastian Perron gets an early chance, but Pierre Gagnon makes the save. Drummondville opens the scoring while on the power play. Hugo Proulx fires it by Popvin. That is their first power play goal of the tourney. Drummondville goes up 1-0. Then a few minutes later, the Saganines tie it up. Perron feeds Steve LaRouche, and he beats Gagnon. That ties it up at 1. Late in the first, Claude Jutras is right in front, but Popvin stones him as he did on many of their efforts on the evening. In the second, Drummondville gets another chance, but Popvin comes through again. This time, he stops Denny Chasse. Late in the second, the puck is directed into the net by the skate of Steve LaRouche, but it is ruled no goal. So on to overtime at the 11.26 mark, Ian LaPerriere will get credit for the game winner, but watch, Steve Gosselin actually batted it into his own net. So while Drummondville celebrates with the win, Gosselin is left to writhe in the misery of his mistake. It was a big night for the goalies, though. Felix Potvin was outstanding. He came up with 52 saves, but Drummondville coach Jean Hamel says that his goalie, Pierre Gagnon, gave his team the win. Yeah, really, that's, uh, Pierre, that's the way he played pretty much all season long, and he came strong for us in this game. It's been that way, like, most of the games against Chikurimi this year, and uh, Potvin always came up pretty big, and, you know, they, they always, like, got a way to, like, give us, like, score a goal that would, like, be, like, kind of a backbreaker, and, uh, and tonight they didn't, you know, we, we, got, we got the goal that made the difference. So. so the Memorial Cup final will put Drummondville against the Spokane Chiefs 
We will have that final live here on TSN beginning at 6 p.m. Eastern. Game two of the Stanley Cup final was played Friday night in Pittsburgh, and the Penguins, powered by a big performance by Mario Lemieux, won the game 4-1. Mike Medano's power play goal for the North Stars set a new NHL record. Minnesota has now scored 33 goals with a man advantage. But Medano's goal was all that they could muster. They were completely shut down by the Penguins. So this series will head back to Bloomington for Game 3 with this series tied up at 1. The North Stars have been almost unbeatable at home. Since January, they've only lost three games. Two in the regular season, only one since the playoffs have began. Now the man who has led them this far is no stranger to the pressure of playoff hockey. It's Bob Gainey. Here's Ken Chilebeck. Bob Gainey played with intensity as a member of the Montreal Canadiens for so many years, and he has taken the same approach in his coaching. He says it took him time, though, to find his legs as a coach. Well, it hasn't all been easy. Uh, I think the NHL and, and coaching or being in the NHL, that was on familiar ground when I started. I'd spent a lot of years around the league, and uh, I had understood the, the ground rules, so yeah. to speak. And, uh, there were many things that I needed to learn and still need to learn as a coach. A discipline is a big part of a coach's role. Every player responds differently to different methods, and it's been part of the learning experience for Bob Gainey. You make decisions on their life, on their livelihood, on their careers, and uh, it's very important uh, how well you know them and how, how you treat them, because it is just that. It's their livelihood. We remember once in L.A. there, we, had, uh, we lost a pretty bad game and didn't let any of the boys go out in L.A., which is like, you know, detriment to your whole career. You live for that. And the next morning, you had us up at 7 o'clock in the morning on the ice at 8 o'clock, just going back and forth. And we, were do, we did more hitting drills in that one drill and uh, one practice than I think we did all year long. Defensive hockey was Ganey's strength as a player and has been a big part of the North Stars' playoff success. But Ganey downplays the experience he had as a player with the Montreal Canadiens. I, I think you could ask any, any coach and they'll tell you that they'd prefer that their teams played well on defense. Huh? Everybody wants to play well on defense and then it, it's a place that uh, you can root a good team game because everybody can participate where a, a strictly offensive oriented game, uh, there's not everybody on the bench that can participate well in that game. Ganey's career as a player was certainly a successful one, among other things, five Stanley Cups with the Canadians. He knew, though, when it was time to quit. It wasn't easy, but he accepted it. I think Ken Dryden said it. He said, it's like getting married. You know you should do it, but you really don't want to. <laughs> and, that's, and that's about the way it is. Uh, I knew it was time for me to go. You, I was holding things up, and it was time for me to move. Ken Chilebeck, TSN in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Today on Sports Desk, the North Stars show the Penguins aren't magnificent without Mario. The Spokane Chiefs try to become only the second U.S.-based team to win the Memorial Cup. And the Jays get bowled over by the White Sox at Comiskey. Everyone, welcome to Sports Desk. I'm Gino Reddo. Nice to have you here. Also coming up, the Pistons and the Bulls open the Eastern Conference Final. The Expos and Giants hit the stick. And the Royal Wedding in Aylmer, Quebec. But first, Game 3 of the Stanley Cup Final. The North Stars and Penguins tied at a game apiece. Just when the Penguins thought they were back at full strength, things just got worse. Paul Coffey saw limited action in Game 2, recovering from a broken jaw. Sunday night, Lemieux had back spasms during the pregame skate and was a late scratch. And to make matters worse for the Pens, the game was in Minnesota where Tom Barrasso and his Penguins have had a hard time winning. Barrasso makes a couple of nice stops here. He robs Dave Gagne, but John Casey equally is solid. Here in the scramble in front of the net, the Penguins just can't beat him with the puck. The second period, Tom Barrasco's luck in goal would end. Mike Modano sends Dave Gagne. Gagne beats Barrasso through the pegs. Makes it 1-0 Minnesota. Just 33 seconds later, the Stars strike again. Bobby Smith lets a rocket go from the face-off circle. Penguins having all kinds of trouble clearing their own zone. Smith takes advantage of it. 2-0 North Stars. Early in the third period, Pittsburgh cuts the Stars' lead in half. Yarma Yeager throws it in front to Phil Bork. And before Casey has a chance to see it, it's in the back of the net. 
The Penguins trail by goal, but Minnesota answers right back. Barrasso stops. Stu Gavin shot with a nice skate stop, but Gaetan Duchesne is there to put in the rebound. The Stars regain their 2-1 lead, and they would never relinquish it. Minnesota over Pittsburgh, 3-1. They now lead the best of seven series, two games to one. Goal scores. Bork for Pittsburgh for Minnesota was Gagne Smith and Duchesne. And after the game, Badger Bob Johnson explained the Mario Lemieux situation. Lemieux, when he came in from the warm-up and he was taking his skates off, he got uh, spasms in his back. And uh, he experienced this in the seventh game against New Jersey. It has nothing to do with this operation that he had or the infection that he had. We just found out uh, when the uh, starting lineup cards came into the uh, dressing room, uh, you know, halfway between the end of warm-up and the beginning of the game. You know, he's showing what he can do on this team. We just want to win without him. We've won without him all year, and we feel we can do it here. Just so much is on the line, and, you know, you start to key on the skill players, and everybody just tries to catch each other with their head down and try to put them out of the series, but uh, it's just going to get uh, probably worse as the series goes on. They have a lot of good offensive players. And uh, guys are going to play up above, and we, we have players that are probably playing a little bit below par, too, because of injuries and the length of playoffs. So it happens to both clubs. I think it's a natural uh, thing when the teams play three games against each other in, uh, in five nights that that's what happens in playoff series. Things start to heat up, and we haven't played Pittsburgh in four or five months, and then we get them three times in five nights. And... There's a lot on the line. There's a lot of uh, emotion in the games. There's a couple of games, you know, it started to hate each other a little bit out there. And, uh, you know, I think it was a pretty good, hard, uh, clean game. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, we have to play a lot better if you want to if you want to play with the next game. Otherwise, it could be real short series. And while the NHL final slowly winds down, Canadian Junior Hockey Supremacy was decided in a one-game winner-takes-all situation. Spokane and Drummondville in the Memorial Cup final. The Chiefs have four of the tournament's top five goal scorers on their team. And not only do they score often, but they score early as well. As a matter of fact, Spokane has scored less than two minutes into every single game they've played at this year's Memorial Cup tournament. And 58 seconds into this period, they keep that string alive. Mike Jickling moves it over the blue line, blasts it home, is second of the tourney, 1-0 Spokane. But Drummondville comes right back. Eric Dadano shoves Trevor Kidd out of the way, and then Dave Paquette puts him in the open net, score tied at one. But from then on, it's all Spokane. Brutal checking by Drummondville. Murray Garbutt scores from in close, and it's 2-1 Chiefs. Then, with just 19 seconds left in the first, Garbutt tees one up and beats Pierre Gagnon upstairs. 3-1 Spokane after just one period of play. Third period, Chiefs up 4-1. Evans moves in and feeds a wide open Pat Falloon. Falloon scores his eighth of the tourney. That ties the record held by Dale Howarchuk and Luke Robitaille for most goals in the Memorial Cup tournament, and it's 5-1 Spokane. As the clock winds down, the Chiefs pour onto the ice. The Spokane Chiefs are the 1991 Memorial Cup champions. They are only the second U.S.-based team to win this title. Portland Winterhawks did it back in 1983. The final this one, Spokane over Drummondville to win the Memorial Cup by a score of 5-1. And after the game, our very own Paul Romanuk filed this report from the Coliseum. Thank you very much, Gino. Lots of celebrating going on just across the hall from our studio. The Spokane Chiefs celebrating the 1991 Memorial Cup championship. They started the celebrations, well, just as the clock was ticking down. The bench clearing off. You see Coach Brian Maxwell standing tall. His second Memorial Cup championship as a coach. And he was at the back of the line, heading on to the ice to offer congratulations. The Chiefs, the 1991 Memorial Cup champions. Pat Falloon had a great tournament, and so too did his line mate and, of course, teammate Ray Whitney. Ray, congratulations. Uh, moments after you picked up this victory, uh, what are your thoughts on it? Well, it hasn't really said it. I don't think it's an incredible feeling. We've worked so hard all year. This is our 100th game tonight. and. We don't there. We didn't play the best game that we wanted to, but we played good enough to win, and uh, it was just this incredible feeling right now. Was it tough to maintain your composure as the time was ticking down, knowing that I mean you had it in your grasp, the champagne was chilling, and so on? Yeah, it definitely was. I think guys were getting anxious. They wanted that clock to keep going. We didn't want any whistles. We didn't really care if we scored another goal the rest of the game. We just wanted to get that that game over with and get at her. And uh, it was tough to keep our composure as as a, you know you can see in the third period we we started to get sloughy and we were starting to you know not play our game and. Uh, but the main thing was that we won, and now we're, we're going to celebrate this one. In what game in this tournament, Ray, did we really see the Western Hockey League champions, Spokane Chiefs, at their best? Well, I think you saw it against uh, the Sault Ste. Marie Greyhounds in the first period. They're, uh, 
you know, we're very explosive, and as you can see, we scored five goals in the first five minutes of that hockey game, and that pretty well put uh, Sault Ste. Marie out of the tournament. And I think that's uh, that's the key to our our success all year is our offense, and we showed that I think only at that one time in, in the first period of that game. And I don't think uh, other than that, we didn't show it really as potent as we really were all year. I know every team sets goals when the season starts, but did you guys consciously sit down at the start of the year and say? I think we can do it this year. We've got the team. I think so. Before the season started, I talked to them, the coaches and the, and the staff, and we felt that we had a good enough team. We have a good enough core, and with a couple changes here and there, that we were going to be able to do it. And uh, they made the right changes. You know, we got to give uh, Tim Speltz and our coaches a lot of credit for making the trade to acquire Trevor Kidd and, and Murray Garbert and the players like that. That's what that's what wins it for us. And uh, we had a great team all all around, and now we're going to enjoy this one. Congratulations. Don't stay out too late. Thank you very much. Ray Whitney and the Spokane Chiefs, the 1991. Yeah, I'm Michael Landsberg. We hope you're enjoying this Memorial Day, and we're glad that you've joined us for a full roundup in what's been happening in sport. We begin with the fireworks in the NHL final and the wildly enthusiastic fans in Minnesota. Now think of how ludicrous that statement would have sounded even two months ago. The North Stars in the final and their fans enthusiastic, but Minnesota is headed for the greatest turnaround in NHL history. Turnaround on the ice, and at the box office, they came one step closer to completing the dream last night as they took a 2-1 to -one series lead over the Penguins who played without Mario Lemieux. Here's Ken Chilibek with more on that game, with more on the crowd, and with more on Lemieux. This is what it is all about, the Stanley Cup. And it's the big attraction in a Bloomington hotel right now. Thousands of hockey fans made the pilgrimage all weekend long to get a glimpse of the ultimate in pro hockey supremacy. This turnout is an indication of what is happening in Minnesota surrounding their hockey club. The best thing about it is it, it helps keep your energy level up. They're so wild up there and they're so loud. And uh, you look up and they're having the greatest time of their lives and you almost wonder who's having more fun, the players or the fans. Now fans arrive early for games and there's no hurry getting into the rink tailgate parties were made famous in this state and it isn't restricted to the game of football it's a party atmosphere and with good reason it's been a long time coming this is big news not just in the minneapolis area but in the entire state it's really easy to get excited out there i think right from the word right from the warm-up we're uh we're all ready to go and we're all excited to play and uh, I think the, the big key in the playoffs for us has been getting that goal early in the first period and it's just gotten our fans behind us. Um, you know, they're all excited about what's happening so they haven't been hard on us at all even if we're not playing that well. They've been sticking behind us and it's been, uh, it's been giving us the ability to pull it out in the third period if we have to because our fans have been so supportive in the playoffs. And the North Stars gave their fans something to cheer about in Game 3. The Penguins, minus Mario Lemieux, tried hard to silence the crowd in the first period. Lemieux was scratched because of a back problem. Except for some huge saves by North Stars goalkeeper John Casey, it may have worked. Casey kept the game scoreless after the first period. But then in the second period, Dave Gagne gave the fans something to go wild over. Taking a pass from Mike Medano, he scored the first of two quick North Star goals. And 33 seconds later, Bobby Smith beat Tom Barrasso on a wrist shot, and that was the game. Well, we're, we're not thinking about being two wins away. We're thinking of uh, playing uh, one more game, and we've got a chance to win a home game and take a 3-1 lead in the series. And we've been in this position uh, twice before in the playoffs, and it's a very big game. You've got to say that both teams know what's on the line, and the team that wins the next game is going to have the advantage to win the series. With the hometown crowd behind them, things are looking pretty good for the Minnesota North Stars heading into game number four now, especially if Mario Lemieux can't play for a second straight game. He suffered back spasms, apparently, putting on his skates just prior to the game. According to Coach Bob Johnson, Lemieux won't make the decision whether he can play or not until just before game time. Ken Cholabek, TSN, in Minneapolis. Sporting News handed out its big awards today, and the two players that won can both testify as to how good the North Stars have become. The player of the year is the Blues' Brad Hull. He led the league with 86 goals, but his Blues were beaten by the North Stars in round number two. Rookie of the year is Chicago goalie Ed Belfort. He led the league with 43 wins and a 2.47 goals against average, but his season ended in the first round at the hand of the Stars. The Kings' Tom Webster is the coach of the year. You can bet if they voted after the playoffs, Bob Ganey would have been a landslide winner. And the Penguins' Craig Patrick is the executive of the year. Stay with us. We have lots more to cover. One we return, the TV TSA. Today, 
on Sports Desk. Mario finally has something to say in Minnesota. El Presidente on top of his game at the Big O. And Jim Acker gets his first start of the season for the Blue Jays. Everybody and welcome to this edition of Sports Desk. I'm Gord Miller. Busy half hour ahead, so let's get right to it. And first up, Game Four of the Stanley Cup Final. Could the Minnesota Magic continue? And the biggest story in Minnesota is the, how the Penguins made a big guy disappear. A guy who's six five. The Penguins were successful in keeping Mario Lemieux under wraps for two days, so the mystery persisted. Would he play in Game Four? And if he didn't, did Pittsburgh have a hope? Well, he did, and so Pittsburgh had a chance after all to win the game and tie the series at two, heading back to the igloo in Pittsburgh. Take a look at game four. Mario Lemieux showing no ill effects from the bad back. And the first period, Pittsburgh starts fast. Kevin Stevens, nice deep beats John Casey, just 58 seconds into the hockey game. Just moments after that, Kevin Stevens up the right side is stopped, and Ron Francis pops it home by John Casey. 2-0 Penguins, but not for long. Look at this. Mark Recchi gets the rebound, and Mario Lemieux gets his 14th of the playoffs. 3-0 Pittsburgh just four minutes in. And then things get a little physical. Alf Samuelson tries to throw the big hit at Basil McCray, but McCray stays standing. Late in the first now, Stars get one back. Brian Bellows sets up Dave Gagne, who slides it by Tom Barrasso. 3-1 mini trails after one. Second period now, Pittsburgh up 4-1. Gagne to Brian Prop. Nice play here. He one times it by Tom Barrasso. A power play goal for two Stars trail. Still in the second. Things continue to get physical as Mario Lemieux drives Brian Bellows in. And they get their gloves and their sticks up and exchange pleasantries. And then Bob Airy, high sticks Mike Madano. Airy gets a penalty, and on the power play, Pittsburgh pays. Mike Madano from the point with Minnesota enjoying a two-man advantage. 4-3 Minnesota trails after 40 minutes. Third period now, and Airy does it again. This time he gets Mark Tenorti. Five minutes and a game, but the Stars... Did not get a shot on the five-minute power play. Late in the game now, John Casey on the bench for Minnesota. Phil Bork finds the empty twine. The Penguins win it by a final score of 5-3. to three. Stevens, Francis, Lemieux, Trotje, and Bork score for the Penguins. Gagne, Prop, and Madonna respond for Minnesota. The series is now tied at two. And what was the difference? 66. You know, he's a dominating uh, player when he's on the ice because everyone on the other team has to worry about him because he does a lot of great things with the puck and he sees so many good things. So, uh, you know, he made some great plays out there. And when it was 3 nothing, he had two or three great chances again. I to have a good start and, and uh, get the lead on these guys. Uh, you know, when they get the lead, they play very well. They have a good system. They forecheck very well. And uh, it's always tough to come back, uh, especially in this building. You know, we all got in there and our penalty kills have been doing a great job in the series in, in the playoffs and you know they wanted to kill it off they're the guys you know i don't kill penalties but they're the guys that go out and say you know let's dig down boys we're this is our job we take pride in, in killing penalties well i think our feeling uh, throughout the game was that that we could come back in the game and uh, right till the dying seconds uh, we thought somewhere that fourth goal might be still on our bench or on one guy's stick who was on the ice it's a tough loss, but uh, at the same time, you know, we thought, you know, the last couple of games we really haven't played as well as we could have, and uh, you, know, you got to look at it the positive because there's so little time left, you can't get down, and we look at it, you know, woke us up, and, you know, for 55 minutes, I thought we played a, you know, a real good game tonight, and we took the play to him, and we just didn't get the win. Still the NHL. <laughs> Today on Sports Desk, can the North Stars freeze out the Penguins at the Igloo? The Montreal Expos are green with envy at the Big O. And it's three up, three down this week for Major League Managers. Welcome to this edition of Sports Desk. I'm Paul Romanuk. Also coming your way in the next half hour or so, the lights go out on Neon Dion. 
Mark Witten and Jack McDowell receiving their sentences for that slugfest on the mound last weekend. But first up, of course, Game 5 of the Stanley Cup Final. And it's down basically heading into this game to a 2 out of 3. Situations like this, with teams tied at 2 apiece, the club that wins the fifth game has won the Stanley Cup 11 of the last 14 times. Let's make that even more clear. Bob Ganey, the coach of the North Stars, nailing it, saying quite simply, this is the biggest game of our careers, most definitely the biggest of the season for Minnesota. Paul Coffey, injuries and all, playing a regular shift. Stu Gavin pushes him into the net, but he's okay. Coffey right into the mix early in this one. Penguins open the scoring, and who else? Mario Lemieux, great reach. 1-0 Pittsburgh on Mario's 15th of the year. Then it's Lemieux again. Tarecki beats Casey. 3-0 Pittsburgh. Penguins not done yet either. They come out blitzing and burning, and it's Recky lifting it over Casey. 4-0 Penguins. The igloo goes nuts. Casey's out. He struck out. Brian Hayward is in. Speaking of out, Basil McCray tries to take out a couple of Penguins, nails Tom Barrasso, and then watch him with Kevin Stevens. Boink. Little WWF. 4-1 to Pittsburgh after 20. Second period. Frank Peterangelo in net for Pittsburgh. Barrasso is injured. He's out with a pulled groin. A physical period. Brian Glenn flattened by Ulf Samuelson. Great hit there. Then Mario on the break. Hayward pulls the rabbit out of the hat. 5-2 pens through two. Third period, Stars come back. Ulf Dallin with the empty net, and he scores. Later on, Brian Propp hits the post. Dave Gagne bangs it home. All of a sudden, it's 5-4. Then late in the game, Larry Murphy sends it towards the goal. Neil Broughton kicks it into his own net. The North Stars were a little myth at first, but you see clearly on the replay that the referee, Kerry Frazier, made a great call. It was directed in off the skate of Neil Broughton. 6-4, the final. Pittsburgh over top of Minnesota. What a game. North Stars power play, anemic. They were 0 for 4 with the man advantage. The Penguins, 2 of 7. Larry Murphy, 4 assists. Mario Lemieux has scored a point in 17 straight games. He has scored a goal in 9 straight. The key in this game for Pittsburgh, the blitzing start. After the first 20, if you get down three goals, it's, you know, it's, it's a tough way back, but... Uh... You know, we just got to carry this this last 40 right into uh, the game on Saturday. We just, uh, you know, we came out strong, and, uh, you know, I think we got a, a couple quick ones, and, uh, you know, uh, and then we seemed to lay back, you know. Uh, I don't know if they had a jump or what, but, uh, you know, we came out skating, and, and when we do that, we're in a very effective team. Well, I think every uh, uh, leader on their team uh, has to do that, and uh, it's my job to go out there, especially early in the game, and set the tempo and, and uh, score the big goal and make the big plays uh, at the right time. And uh, uh, last couple of games, we seem uh, uh, to be doing that very well. Should be a great finish of that series. Baseball. Oh, did you see that hit that Elf Samuelson laid on Brian Glenn the other night? For that matter, did you see the hit Samuelson laid on Cam Neely in the Boston series? Or, well, I'll take your pick. There are a few players skating or limping around after being slammed by Samuelson in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Getting traded from Hartford to Pittsburgh, a great break for Samuelson. Usually at this time of the year, in his career, the only thing Samuelson was hammering was the odd three wood down the fairway. Number five, Ulf Samuelson, would look good playing in an old World War II movie, and he'd definitely be the villain. Samuelson has been the thorn in the side of virtually every team the Penguins have played in the playoffs. His hit on Cam Neely in the Boston series could have been the play that eliminated the Bruins. And against the North Stars, he hasn't mellowed out one bit. Well, Ulf is a great defenseman. As you mentioned, he's the guy the other teams like to hate, but... Would love to have on your hockey club, probably no different than Essa ticking in with the Oilers. And I think anybody around the league uh, knows also great defenseman, stays back, takes the body. You can play him in any situation out there. And he was just a real key acquisition for our hockey team. Samuelson was acquired from Hartford at the trade deadline. As a member of the Whalers, he didn't command the attention he is getting right now. It happened real quick. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's just... Uh, it's a tremendous feeling, you know, going from Hartford, which, you know, I've played for a few years and never really accomplished anything. And then now you're in the middle of your you know, childhood dream right now. So it's, it's just an unbelievable feeling. Samuelson has been criticized for his sometimes apparent dirty hits. And you add to that, he's not a bad actor at times himself. I'm just trying to do whatever I've always been doing. And I guess it gets more attention now when it comes down to the final. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to to stir things up or anything like that. I'm just trying to, to play the game I always play. 
Say what you want about Ulf Samuelson, but it seems like every team in the National Hockey League, at least the good teams, have a player like him, at least in his role, whether it is an Essa Tikkanen of the Edmonton Oilers or, let's say, a Marty McSorley of the Los Angeles Kings. He has a role to play, and he's effective at it. Ken Chulabek, TSN, in Pittsburgh. And the Stanley Cup final, next game, Pittsburgh leading the series three games to two. It is tomorrow, and they can perhaps start to chill the champagne. At least the Penguins are hoping so. Real TV. Today on Sports Desk, the Pittsburgh Penguins take home their first Stanley Cup title. Todd Stottlemyre hopes to keep his perfect record intact for the Blue Jays. And a confrontation at the Palace in Auburn Hills, the Pistons against the Bulls. Welcome to Sports Desk, everyone. Also coming up in the next half hour, the Texas Rangers look to extend their 11-game winning streak in American League play. We've got the complete baseball story, both the Expos and Blue Jays in action on Saturday. But first, Game 6 of the Stanley Cup Final. The Pittsburgh Penguins didn't qualify for the Stanley Cup playoffs last season, but what a difference a year can make. Saturday night at the Met Center in Bloomington, Minnesota, the Penguins were on the verge of winning their first Stanley Cup ever. Pittsburgh led the championship series three games to do, coming in and hoping to wrap it up on the road. And just nine seconds into the game, Neil Broughton in the penalty box for interference. Penguins on the power play. Alf Samuelson's shot from the point finds its way through traffic, and it's 1-0 Penguins. But the Stars continue to play it tough. Mark Tenori levels Kevin Stevens in the neutral zone. Then just minutes later, Brian Bellows smacks Samuelson from behind into the rear boards. Midway through the first, Pittsburgh shorthanded. Mario puts on a show. Goes to the backhand. Beautiful goal for Mario, his 16th 2 0 Penguins. Then, just 55 seconds later, Pittsburgh man advantage. Stevens will hook the puck out to Joe Mullen. Here is Stevens at the side of the net. Nice pass in front. Mullen puts it in. Once again, Pittsburgh is in front 3 0. Tom Barrasso, excellent in this game. Big save here. The Stars switch goalies at the start of period number two. Brian Hayward fared no better, though. With Pittsburgh up 4-0, Ron Francis goes in alone and beats Hayward through the five-hole, and the route is on. Down 5-0, Stars' frustration begins to show. Shane Gerla lands a rabbit punch on Phil Bork. Then later in the period, ex-Penguin Jim Johnson runs Mark Recchi from behind, face first into the boards. Later on, it's Joey Mullen, breakaway for Pittsburgh. Mullen picks the top corner, 6-0, Penguins in front. Yeah, you're starting to get the picture. The uh, wives of the Penguins are very happy, as are their husbands. Time runs out in the third period. Pittsburgh shuts out Minnesota, 8-0. The Penguins win their first Stanley Cup ever. Mario Lemieux la named the uh, playoffs MVP. He wins the Conn Smythe Trophy. The Pittsburgh Penguins are the 1990-91 Stanley Cup champions, winning the series four games to two. Tom Barrasso stopping 39 shots for his first ever career playoff shutout. With more from the Met Center in Bloomington, here's TSN's Ken Chilbeck. It has been a long time coming for the Pittsburgh Penguins, their first ever Stanley Cup final and a championship, but it certainly was far from easy. The two teams split the first two games in Pittsburgh, and then they moved here to Minnesota, where the North Stars went ahead in the series two games to one. And then it was Mario Lemieux taking over as he led the Penguins to three straight victories and the Stanley Cup. Is this the most fun you've ever had? Oh, yeah. It's, it's the ultimate that's dream. That's you feel you've had three games in the playoffs kind of long for two weeks? Well, I think I had to. Uh, the team was, was playing uh, very well at the time, and my job was to uh, lead them to the top and make the big plays and score the big goals when, uh, when, he, when they needed me, and uh, fortunately, I did, I did the job. Well, Mario was fantastic. I mean, you can't say enough about him. He was facing a career-threatening injury, came back. Uh, a lot of people were doubting him in the first series against Jersey, but he was he was injured at the time during that. And he didn't have to prove to anybody in this room what he's all about. We know he's a great hockey player. And he proved that he's one of the best, if not the best in the league right now with that uh, 
performance today and winning the Conn Smythe and leading this hockey club to a Stanley Cup. I mean, it's just great. Despite the lopsided final game, the North Stars have no reason to hang their head. They proved they belong. I think the thing that that was missing and that was important for, for this team and this franchise was a was to be respected and to be recognized and I think we've put ourselves and our players and our team in front of our community and in front of the NHL and and we've shown them that this is a team that wants to participate and wants to be competitive and it's an organization that will do what it has to do to get that kind of team onto the ice. All fairy tales have an ending. Unfortunately, this is not one of the ones the North Stars would have written for their story, at least. It was the Mario Lemieux story. He had a great, great series. His first opportunity to shine in a series such as this. He proved once and for all that he is one of the great players in the game. The Pittsburgh Penguins, this year's Stanley Cup champions. Ken Chilovec, TSN in Bloomington. Thank you, Kenny. And our two-month playoff marathon is finally over. Some other hockey news. Yerry Curry says he'd like to reunite with the former teammate Wayne Gretzky. Curry left the NHL last season to play with Milan of the Italian League. His NHL rights still belong to the Edmonton Oilers, but the Oilers say they're in no big hurry to trade those rights. The Los Angeles Kings are one of several NHL teams hoping to acquire Curry's rights. Curry says he would like to return to the NHL with any team except the Oilers. Still with hockey, after 14 years in the NHL, veteran goaltender Glenn Hanlon could be hanging up his skates. Hanlon was hoping to end his career with Team Canada at the 1992 Winter Olympics. But national team head coach Dave King says Hanlon has left the team's evaluation camp and has decided to retire. Hanlon played just 19 games with Detroit last season. When reached for comment, he said he wasn't ready to make a formal announcement. And Ben Johnson was back in the starting blocks at a track meet in Spain. Today on Sports Desk, for the first time in history, the Stanley Cup has found a home in Pittsburgh. The 75th running of the Indianapolis 500 turns out to be an outstanding battle. And the Jays battle the California Angels in the rubber game of their series in California. Desk is brought to you by Goodyear. From tune-ups to tires, Goodyear takes you home. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm Michael Landsberg. It has been a very busy Sunday in sport. We have got all kinds of highlights to show you, but before we get to this afternoon, let's look back to last night. And repeat after me. The Penguins are Stanley Cup champions. The Pittsburgh Penguins are Stanley Cup champions. If you're like me, that just doesn't sound right. It goes against what history has taught us about the Penguins. But as hard as it is to believe, the Penguins have done it. They did it last night, and they did it in a way that was totally convincing. They buried the North Stars in the biggest game of the year. And last night showed why once a decade, when a franchise player is available, you can't pass up the opportunity to draft him. Quebec Nordique, take note. Number 66, Mario Lemieux. He was the Penguins' first pick of the 1984 entry draft. He was called a franchise player, but even if he was, how good could he make this struggling Pittsburgh hockey club? Yes, he was a superstar, not a miracle worker. Lemieux and the Penguins struggled through six seasons. They only made the playoffs once. Then, as if things weren't bad enough, Lemieux suffered a chronic back injury. He missed the latter half of the last season and the first 50 games this year. He didn't know if he would ever play again, but he did return. Coming up. Look at Lemieux. Oh, my heavens. What a goal. What a move. Lemieux. Oh, baby. Saturday night in Pittsburgh, Lemieux put himself in the class with former hockey greats. It was clearly his moment. He had hockey's ultimate prize in his grasp. He established himself as one of the best and most influential players to ever play the game. Oh, well, it means everything uh, to be part of a championship team and especially after last year where I played most of the year with back pain and got the surgery and then the infection. Uh, I didn't think I was going to come back that strong uh, towards the end of the year and I was, I was able to do that and uh, every time you have a chance to uh, be in the Stanley Cup final and win it, uh, it's got to be the ultimate dream and um, it feels great. Romero is fantastic. I mean, you can't say enough about him. He was facing a career-threatening injury, came back, uh, a lot of people were doubting him in the first series against Jersey, but he was he was injured at the time during that. And 
he didn't have to prove to anybody in this room what he's all about. We know he's a great hockey player. And he proved that he's one of the best, if not the best in the league right now with that uh, performance he did and winning the Conn Smythe and leading this hockey club to a Stanley Cup. I mean, it's just great. A few thoughts about Mario. Uh, I'm just great. He just played unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, Unbelievable. Unbelievable. This is all about right here. <laughs> Comment about Mario. Phenomenal. That's about it. Lemieux had four points in the 8 0 finale, giving him 12 for the series and 44 for the playoffs. More than enough to earn him the con smite. The 8 0 blowout removed most, if not all, of the drama when the final horn blew a considerably calm team celebrated rather quietly. Whooping it up the most was the veteran Brian Trachia. He seemed to be having the most fun. And although it was his fifth cup, he carried on like a first-timer. As for the Cinderella North Stars, the clock finally struck midnight. They just came up flat at the wrong time. They made a great run and have nothing to be ashamed of. Rookie coach Bob Ganey had the team playing perhaps the best hockey in the franchise's history. I think the thing that that was missing and that was important for for this team and this franchise was a was to be respected and to be recognized and I think we've put ourselves and our players and our team in front of our community and in front of the NHL and and we've shown them that this is a team that wants to participate and wants to be competitive and it's an organization that will do what it has to do to get that kind of team onto the ice well, he was sad, but these guys are happy. This is the scene outside Pittsburgh International Airport. At 2 this morning, thousands of fans turned out to cheer their fans and catch a glimpse of something they've never seen in person before. The Stanley Cup. That was a wild scene, and for most very exciting, but very sadly, the event was uh, somewhat ruined. 30-year-old man fell from an overhang while dancing, celebrating the Pittsburgh Penguins Stanley Cup victory at 2.30 this morning, and police say he died instantly. 30-year-old man dying in the celebration. Dude, spectacular. Pittsburgh is once again earning that title. The Penguins Stanley Cup win, coupled with the Pirates title in the National League East last year, makes these heady days indeed in the Steel City. Tomorrow they'll throw a parade for the Penguins, the seventh championship parade for the city of Pittsburgh in 20 years. Well, here's the kind of deal we're likely to see a lot more of in the NHL over the next few days. A team knows it's going to lose a player in the expansion draft, so it trades the player away instead. The Buffalo Sabres said goaltender Darcy Walker looked to Minnesota for futures. The Sabres are set to protect Clint Malarchuk and Darren Pupa in the upcoming... Yes, I am. Today on Sports Desk, it's the party most figured would never happen, the Penguin Stanley Cup celebration. We'll look at the hottest team in Major League Baseball, the Texas Rangers, who won 14 in a row. And we'll see if the red play at Roland Garros claimed Pete Sampras as an upset victim. Desk is brought to you by Motomaster, Canada's number one selling replacement parts. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm Michael Landsberg. Also ahead as the NHL trading deadline approaches for the expansion draft, a deal to tell you about. Flashback with one of baseball's pitching masters, Warren Spawn. And lacrosse, the sport that once was, is trying to be again. But up front today, the party that most figured would never happen, the Pittsburgh Penguins Stanley Cup party. Since the league expanded in 1967 to include the Penguins, can you remember a single moment when the Penguins even looked like potential champions? Even this year, placing first in the Patrick, few took them seriously. After all, these were the Penguins. But the Penguins and their fans are enjoying the last laugh. Up front today, the Penguins party. minute celebration and everyone who's anyone was on hand to enjoy the party. The most valuable player in the 1991 Stanley Cup playoff, Mario Lemieux. <laughs> Just a couple words on behalf of the players. I'd like to thank the city of Pittsburgh, 
and the fans that have been supporting us for the last 24 years. We love you guys, and this cup is for you. Thank you. You know, when we started and we looked up at the top of the arena, we had no banners. And now we are extremely proud that next season we will have the Patrick Division Championship banner going up. The Patrick Division Playoff Championship banner going up. The Prince of Wales Conference Championship going up. And we're extremely proud to let you know that in the last 50 years, we're only one of 10 teams will put up the Stanley Cup championship banner. People began arriving as early as 7 a.m. for the noontime party, and if forward Phil Bork has his way, the celebrations will continue for a long time. What do you say we take this out on the river? It's party all summer! I think he means it. The fact that the Penguins made the final at all was so surprising. Acceptance of any team comes slowly, and when you have a checkered past like the Penguins, it takes that much longer. But if you consider history, then the fact that the Penguins won the final series at all is not a surprise. In 1927, the Pittsburgh Pirates lost the World Series to the Yankees. That was the Murderer's Row team. Since then, no Pittsburgh team. Baseball, football, and now hockey has been beaten with the championship on the line. The streak began in 1960 with Bill Mazeroski's series-winning homer to beat the New York Yankees. Here's a swing and a high fly ball going deep to left. This may do it. Back to the wall goes Barra. It is over the fence. Homer and the Pirates win. Eleven years later, in 1971, the Pirates, led by World Series MVP Roberto Clemente, returned to the World Series. Here's Bobby Clemente. It's a screwball a mile in the left center field. Clemente batted 4-12 and was named MVP as the Bucks beat the Baltimore Orioles in seven games. From there, the city's football team, the Steelers, took center stage. They won four Super Bowls in six seasons from 1975 to 1980. He's going to throw. He's a throw. Touchdown. Lynn Swan, touchdown. In that same time, the Pirates won another championship. It was 1979, the year that Willie Stargell and the family beat the Orioles in the World Series. This was the first time they got to celebrate a Stanley Cup title, and it put Pittsburgh in a very small class, with only New York and Chicago as cities who have won a Stanley Cup, a Super Bowl, and a World Series. Pittsburgh is, once again, the city of Pittsburgh. Today on Sports Desk, the hottest bat in baseball leads the Blue Jays against the Cleveland Indians looking for a sweep. U.S. President George Bush apparently not a big fan of the Pittsburgh Penguins. And a candid interview with John McEnroe. is brought to you by Motomaster, Canada's number one selling replacement parts. Welcome to the show, everyone. I'm Michael Landsberg. Also ahead, a look at the Major League's hottest swinger, Joe Carter. A look at boxing's hottest rivalry, Tyson Ruddock. And a look at our hottest Monday item, Plays of the Week. For a kinder and gentler hockey team today, as they met George Bush in Washington, Stanley Cup champions toured the White House, and it was a special honor for Bob Johnson because he is the first American-born coach in 50 years to win the Stanley Cup. And it was all smiles and handshakes on the White House lawn today. George Bush walking around Pittsburgh, the only the second NHL team to ever visit the White House. The New York Islanders were there back in 83 after they won their fourth Stanley Cup. And afterwards, here was President Bush. So you're champions on the ice and off the ice, and welcome to all of you. We're just delighted you're here on this beautiful day. Thanks for coming. 
Hey, Ed, is there sure will be a uh, miniature trophy? Let's see if it looks like the bed, like we make it. That's fantastic. Thank you. Glad to see you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. The best to your son. Thank you. Now, do I get something else, I'm hoping? <laughs> and you are? Mario and you. Mario, I was talking about you. I had that feeling. I had that feeling. <laughs> talking about you. On behalf of the team, I'd like to present to you with uh, this sweater of the Stanley Cup champions. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. And congratulations. Yeah. On your and Mario later asked the president what his name was as well. Friday night in Las Vegas. Congratulations. Yeah. On your he had that feeling. Some young things and made all the right moves in the Gulf War earlier this year, but you can excuse him if he gets his hockey players mixed up. Bush was on hand at the White House to personally greet the Stanley Cup champion Pittsburgh Penguins today. That's the latest rage in America. You know, I have the champions over for a visit on the White House lawn. So far this year, the New York Giants, Colorado Buffaloes, Duke Blue Devils, Chicago Bulls have visited the president. Today, it was those nameless ice warriors. <laughs> and you are? Mario Lemieux. Mario, I was talking about you. Well, I had that feeling. I had that feeling <laughs> talking about you. On behalf of the team, I'd like to present to you with uh, this sweater of the Stanley Cup champions. Fantastic. Thank you very, very much. And congratulations. Thank you. Is that it? Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Painless. <laughs> Let me say hello. Thank you very much. Good to see you all. Let me just say hello to these older right, over here. Yeah, 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 I know. Good the tentative yeah. purchase of the Pittsburgh Penguins, but the bottom line appears to be there aren't that many people around with $65 million to spend on an NHL team and arena. So today, the league's board of governors approved the sale of the Penguins to Howard Baldwin and Morris Felsberg, and they were in New York to assure the board of governors that they do not plan to sell off star players in order to finance their purchase of the club, and that clearly was one of the major concerns. We have no intention whatsoever of moving this team out of Pittsburgh. That's the furthest thing from our mind. We don't need a club to agree not to move. Anybody that comes into this league knows... Coming up on Sports Desk, Bob Johnson dead at the age of 60. A golden glove to cap off a slightly tarnished season. And join the parade as the Argos celebrated championship season. is brought to you by Right Guard Deodorant. Anything else would be uncivilized. And by Chrysler Canada. All you have to do is drive one. Hello there, welcome to Sports Desk. Also coming up in the next half hour, we'll take a look at the Leafs trying to extend their winning streak to two. That would be a season high on the road. A little hockey history tonight in the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League to tell you about. But first up, Bob Johnson dying of brain cancer early this morning. Yes, Paul, there was some optimism when Bob Johnson's brain surgery to remove a brain tumor was originally deemed a success, but tragically his condition has gradually worsened now. Late in the summer, Johnson had problems with slurred speech and weakness in his legs and arms. August 29th, he had surgery to remove a malignant brain tumor. He then returned to his home in Colorado to have radiation treatment on a second tumor. Friends and family realized the prognosis was not good, but that didn't make Bob Johnson's death any easier to accept. Excuse me. <clears throat> that was very family-like, and, uh, and he he was really like the father to our organization. And uh, it takes a special man to be able to come into a, a group of young people and and uh, and people within our staff. That uh, and he just it takes a special man to be able to do what he did uh, with this organization. And certainly the influence he's had on me and then the rest of the team will remain with us forever. And you know, we're, we plan to carry on and his goal was to, to win Stanley Cups. And we're gonna go on with that goal of his. I think especially when you lose uh not only a great coach, but a great person like uh, Bob. Um, 
you know, you look back at what he's done for uh, uh, the city and uh, this team in one year, uh, it's pretty incredible. And, uh, you know, everybody liked him. Uh, I think everybody that played for him, I have a lot of respect for him. Uh, I think nothing gave him greater pleasure than being behind the bench and, and seeing us uh, us play well, on, you know, under his leadership. And that's how I'm going to remember Bob. Until it really happens, you don't really realize what it's, uh, what's, you know, he's a big part of us is gone now, but um, we just have to uh, stick together and try to help each other out. Right now, I think everybody really feels for his family, you know, for his wife and, uh, <coughs> and kids. I mean, we, we all feel for them. You spent five years with an organization, as Bob Johnson did with the Calgary Flames, and you are prone to making either a lot of friends or a lot of enemies. In Bob Johnson's case, it was very much the former, whether it was an inspirational speech or faith in a late-round draft pick. Bob Johnson left a few smiles behind in Calgary. In Calgary, the news of Bob Johnson's death was greeted with sorrow. Many of the current Flames, along with their coach, Doug Riseborough, owe much of their development to Johnson's genius. I guess the best I ever saw that tested was when we were in the playoffs against Edmonton down 3-1 and we'd just given our hearts and lost the two at home and had to go up there and possibly facing elimination and Badger came in the room and told him told us how we had him right where we wanted him and I thought he had cracked in but the more I talked to him the more I believed him and we were I think uh, one goal away from making it a reality but that stands out and that was the infectious part of, of Bob and when I got a chance to see him in Denver, he certainly physically wasn't the same guy. He had come through the surgery and the radiation treatments, and yet you look in his eyes and it was the same Bob. When I was a younger guy, and uh, I think he was the biggest reason I was drafted by the Flames. Uh, you know, I was a, a late-round draft pick, and I think he had a lot to, to do with me being drafted by the Flames, and he gave me a, the chance to play my rookie season here, plus all the you know two Canada Cups I played. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's just, it's a black day in hockey. I always uh, remembered his energetic uh, style in the mornings, you know, and he always made the game fun and uh, was a, it was a great feeling to come to the rink and have uh, him smiling at me and asking me if I had my cornflakes that morning and things like that. It's definitely a sad day for hockey. It's a sad day around here because Bob touched our hearts. Uh, for so many years and, and brought success to the Calgary Flames and made us a better hockey team. And I know uh, our heart goes out to Martha and uh, we miss him. Johnson's years in Calgary were marked by the development of the franchise into one of the NHL's best. He took some talented individuals and honed their skills into a solid team. All who played for him and worked with him are better for the experience. And in Calgary, while they mourn his loss, they celebrate his life. Peter Watts, TSN, in Calgary. Bob Johnson made some major contributions to the game in the United States. Fifteen years in U.S. college hockey, two years as the executive director of the USA Amateur Hockey Association. He did a lot for the game on the amateur level, but he will likely be most remembered for his success in the NHL. By the time Bob Johnson took over as head coach of the Calgary Flames during the summer of 1982, he was known to everyone in the hockey world as Badger Bob. He had coached the University of Wisconsin Badgers for 15 seasons before succumbing to the lure of the NHL. During his five-year stay in Calgary, the Flames only finished lower than second in their division once, making it to the Stanley Cup Finals in 1986, only to lose to the Montreal Canadiens in five games. After leaving the Flames, Johnson took over as executive director of USA Hockey, which runs the amateur program in the States, and remained in the job until 1990. It was in the summer of that year the call of the NHL once again lured Johnson to the Pittsburgh Penguins and what he believed was a real shot at the one trophy that had eluded his grasp throughout his career, the Stanley Cup. The Penguins were a team blessed with the superstar talent of Mario Lemieux and Paul Coffey and surrounded by a solid supporting cast of Mark Recchi, Kevin Stevens and John Cullen. But it was Johnson's positive approach to the game and to life in general that brought the best out of a team of perennial underachievers. The Penguins won the Stanley Cup in May of 1991. It was the first for the franchise, and tragically, the last for Badger Bob. Whether it was at the amateur, professional, international, or Olympic level, Bob Johnson always managed to get the best from his players.